The process of determining the age of something can be quite fulfilling. Perhaps one day we'll be able to apply such a process to the gods. I suggest we start with Vali, given that Vali is the youngest of the Norse gods. This would make for an especially interesting process that I'm sure would be, um, validating. After Finra the Destroyer consumes Odin and Sol, setting events into motion to bring about the end of the world, one deity shows no fear in standing against him. This is Vithar, the Silent One, who finally stops Finra's rampage. The wolf has killed his father and his kin, and Vithar does what is demanded of him by honor and law. The wolf attacks him with an open mouth to swallow yet another god, but Vithar is quicker. His boot slams against the wolf's lower jaw, and he splits open Fenrir's head at the mouth, ripping off his head at the jaw. Vengeance is his. This is Snorri's account of Vithar, the silent god, god of vengeance, which conflicts lightly with other records that Snorri himself even preserved. The poetic Edda depicts Vithar in the same light, but instead stabbing Fenrir in the heart, ending the wolf's wrath. Vithar and Finrur are on two opposing paths of revenge. Finrur seeks to bring down the gods for their trickery, for his binding in exile. Vithar avenges his father, who dies at the wolf's jaws. Snorri also records an interesting little bit of uh, folklore along with this, which is that Vithar's boot is the result of our contribution. His boot grows in power each time someone scrapes away little bits of leather from their shoes and discards the waist. And these little bits of leather are said to find their way to Vithar's boot, protecting him from Fenrir's jaws. Interestingly, one of Vithar's kennings is the possessor of the iron shoe. I've always found like oddly specific mythic references to stuff like this interesting. My dude is rolling around with an iron shoe because there's a prophecy that he has to step on a wolf jaw. Not shoes, Shoe. He has one iron shoe with this specific function that collects wasted leather. So I just have this image of the silent god hobbling around with a metal shoe, singular, bulked out with leather as he goes searching for more leather to add on to this comically oversized foot covering. Myth is covered in little things like this, and the choices are... I mean, well, they're choices. Vithar is often paired with Vali, another god of vengeance and the youngest of the Norse gods. The Voluspa mentions Vali's taking vengeance for the death of Baldur against Baldur's killer. Under the same rules of vengeance that Vithar applies for the killing of Fenrir, Vali kills Hothar, who is held responsible for Baldur's death. This opens up an interesting conversation about the responsibility for the death of Baldur. In several passages, when responsibility is assigned for the death of Baldur, Holther, not Loki, is the one who is brought up. Valley's process of vengeance echoes what is described in the sagas, in which revenge killings, especially for family, is common. In this tradition, the primary responsibility falls upon the one who did the killing itself, rather than Loki who would be seen as a conspirator in this case. The basic thrust of the death of Baldur, according to Snorri, goes like this. Baldur had bad dreams predicting his death, and Frigg, his mother, makes everything in the cosmos swear an oath not to harm Baldur, except for the mistletoe, because it's too young. Loki finds this out and keeps this information. The gods find the effect of this rather humorous and start throwing things at Baldur, and everything just bounces right off. Loki finds Hothar, the blind god, and sets about to convince him to join in on the fun. Hothar says he wants to, but he can't see where Baldur is. Loki happily solves this issue, and he points Hothar in the right direction and hands him a piece of sharpened mistletoe. Such that sharpening mistletoe is possible, but whatever, not important. Hothar throws, hitting Baldur, Baldur dies, and this is Hothar's fault. Snorri's record on this myth is a little confusing because you would think that the Aesir would be able to see through this sort of trickery and get to the bottom of the issue, yet Vali seems to ignore the subtlety here and brings about Hothar's death, the suggestion being that even an accidental death is worthy of absolute revenge. And this lines up with the laws described in the sagas, but often these situations were part of a frustrating narrative rather than a celebrated one. Greta the Strong, for example, is sentenced to outlawry as part of his long string of bad luck through accidental actions rather than intentional ones. 
The accounts in the Poetic Edda of Valley's vengeance do not seem to suggest some kind of misplaced honor or incomplete task or even a morally gray, dutiful necessity. It seems to suggest that Valley is entirely justified in this endeavor, which suggests that perhaps... Perhaps Holther had more responsibility than Snorri's story suggests. The Voluspa in the Poetic Edda puts it like this. He never washed his hands nor combed his hair until he brought Baldur's adversary to the funeral pyre. Baldur's adversary being a kenning for Holther, not Loki. We're going we're gonna to go down this road for a little bit, but uh, bear with me. The complexity around Halther's relationship with Baldur helps shed a little light on why Valley interprets vengeance in the way that he does, who Baldur is, why he's considered Baldur's adversary, and why this means vengeance must be taken varies a little bit between the Icelandic and Danish traditions. So let's take a closer look at the Danish tradition of Baldur and Halther. The Danish tradition is written by Saxo Grammaticus, who lived around the same time as Snorri. In Saxo's History of the Danes, there is another, very different account of Baldur. And in this account, there is a valley equivalent who takes vengeance on Holther for the death of Baldur. But Holther is more overtly responsible for Baldur's death. There's a ton of differences, and it's a euhemerous tale in which Saxo describes Holther as a human and Baldur as a demigod son of Odin, who Saxo also holds as a human wizard, but whatever. Loki is absent. Nana falls in love with Holther and Holther with her. But Baldur wants her for himself. Nana, however, is not interested in Baldur and instead would rather be with Holther. And herein lies the conflict. There's a series of battles between them in which Holther retains Nana, and this culminates to a final showdown in which Holther finds a way to defeat Baldur's invulnerability and exploits it, killing a son of Odin. Now, Odin, lamenting the death of his son, obtains a prophecy, and Saxo credits this to a Sami fortune teller. The Poetic Edda credits this to a Cirrus that Odin raises from the dead in order to interpret Baldur's dreams, which foretells that Halther will kill Baldur. Both attest that Rind will birth a child to take vengeance for Baldur's death. Snorri attests that Rind is won by Odin through magic, though no details are given. Saxo does give details, but it seems that he kidnapped some rather sordid details from the gruesome revenge story of Wayland the Smith and put it into this narrative, making Rin the victim of assault, which is the YouTube safe way of saying this. It's hard to tell whether or not this story has any authentic details in it about Rind, considering that Saxo had a habit of demonizing the gods as much as possible in his retellings. Saxo may have altered an existing story, or invented a whole new story to demonize Odin by likening him to Wayland. Whatever story this was based on was not preserved by Snorri, so we have nothing to compare it to, and therefore has been lost to time. These same issues of bias plague Saxo's story of Holther and Baldur. Was Saxo writing a story to demonize the gods here as well? Does Saxo recast Nana as the love of Holther and not Baldur in order to demonize Baldur? The absence of Loki is interesting. This suggests that there was once a version of the story in which Holther kills Baldur in a way that isn't instigated by Loki. Loki's involvement in the story may have been a later development, or a geographical variant, or even inserted by Snorri himself. There is, however, a very interesting story from Celtic tradition that may explain some of the differences between Saxo's story and Snorri's story of Holther and Baldur. In the story of the death of Fergus, the blind Luev is tricked into throwing a spear into the back of his foster brother, killing him on the spot. The man Alil is jealous of Fergus, and while Fergus is bathing in the lake with his lady, Alil convinces Luev that the sound of their bathing is a deer and a doe, and Luaith suggests slaying them, and Alil suggests that Luaith be the one to throw the spear. And Luaith says to just hand him the spear and point him in the right direction. Alil does so, and Luaith throws the spear straight through Fergus. So compare that to Snorri's story of Hothor killing Baldur, and we might recognize a few parts of this, as Loki leads Hothor to Baldur, hands him the mistletoe, 
and then directs Hulther where to throw the mistletoe that kills Balder. And yet Hulther is the one seen as the rival by Vali, not Loki. In the Celtic legend, Alil, the one who sets up the scenario, not Lueve, is seen as responsible for the killing, despite the fact that he wasn't the one who threw the spear. And there's even a version of the story in which the spear that kills Fergus is mentioned as being one of hardened holly. So it even has the plant motif. It's, uh, it's not exactly clear whether or not Snorri was entirely familiar with what mistletoe is. It's often brought up that mistletoe doesn't really manifest as a stick, which is what's described in the Hulther Loki version. But who knows? Maybe... Halther just has one heck of a throwing arm. Mistletoe can't really kill when thrown by a normal man, but if Halther is throwing mass at the speed of light or something crazy, he'll do damage just about anything. Whatever the case, it seems very likely that Snorri just took this Celtic story and used it to make Halther kill Balder while demonizing Loki, who may have never been involved in this story in the first place. The Celtic story could have also organically influenced Icelandic tradition independent of Snorri. We'll never know. I honestly think that a significant part of the practice of heathenry is yelling incoherently at historical records for their habit of incomplete information. It's certainly a part of my spirituality. This whole situation leads me to believe that while the story from Saxo is likely one that is heavily Christianized, euhemerized, and full of demonization, it may give us a closer image of what Holther and Baldur's rivalry may have looked like than Snorri's story. And this would make Valley's story of vengeance make much more sense. Alil's jealousy in the death of Fergus may have been seen as a comparison for Halther's jealousy over Nana, or the other way around, as Saxo tells it. I wish we had more examples of this story to draw from, but alas, we only have two wildly different tellings. Saxo's story ends with Bo, Saxo's expression of Valley, killing Halther in combat, but receiving mortal wounds himself. He is carried home on his shield, and he dies the next day in agony from his wounds. In this version of the story, there are many victims to Odin's schemes, and nothing is mentioned of Nana's fate. There's not much mentioned about Vithar and Valley beyond their functions as takers of vengeance. They aren't depicted as particularly wrathful deities, though. Their conception of vengeance is simple, targeted, and focused. They have a single goal to which they seem oathed, and that oath comes coupled with an abstinence of some kind. In Vithar's case, it is his silence. In Vali's case, he remains unwashed. Vali's abstinence from grooming is backed up by historical attestations. Tacitus, the Roman historian, writes of the Chadi in Germania that warriors would not groom until they had made their first kill. As a result, those who are cowards would remain unwashed their whole lives until their lives were taken on the battlefield. Another famous oath of this sort is that of Harold Fairhair, who oathed that he would not cut nor comb his hair until he had conquered all of Norway to gain the love of Githa. Unlike the, uh, the television show Vikings, which does Harold all kinds of wrong in my opinion, Harold does conquer all of Norway. He gains Githa as his bride, and then he finally sits down to comb and cut his hair. And it is at this point that Harold gains the name Fair Hair for his long and beautiful hair now that he's finally combed it. So, pro tip for those of you looking to have beautiful hair, by the way. Don't comb or wash it for 10 years, conquer all of Norway, really any Scandinavian country will do, and then do a full spa treat yourself day and give your hair a full combing and washing. Your hair will be worthy of a nickname, and I can personally attest that this works. After Vithar plays his part in Ragnarok, Finrur is gone, and the dust settles. The described survivors are Vithar, Vali, the sons of Thor, Modi, and Magni, and a revived Holther and Baldur who have made peace with one another. Snorri writes that they will sit together and discuss the mysteries of the world and of events past. Thor's sons shall share Mjolnir, and there will be found a set of golden game pieces that belong to the Aesir. The, uh... The game pieces are an interesting mention. They might have some connection with fate or the powers of the gods, but it's unknown, really. It could be that the gods simply enjoy the Viking precursor to chess. It could mean that there's a lost story somewhere discussing the relationship between a game that the gods play and the battles of the world or something to that effect. 
The world after Ragnarok, after vengeance has been fulfilled, seems to be a world that has been purged of flaws, which to me is a mark of Christian influence on the story. Vali and Vithar, despite the rules around vengeance, do not seem to be worried about vengeance being taken on them. Vali took vengeance on Hothar, who has been revived, so it's hard to consider that vengeance on him would be required. Vithar took vengeance on Fenrir, but it's unknown if any of the wolves in Fenrir's brood yet wait for a chance to take their revenge for their father. Perhaps Vithar is doomed to forever look over his shoulder, concerned that Hati, or Skoll, may find him. But it does seem that these surviving gods are met with a new challenge before them. The last lines of the Voluspa's description of Ragnarok feature Nidhogg, risen from his slumber with corpses dropping from his wings over land. One version of the Voluspa pits Nidhogg against the Almighty, which seems to be another Christian insert of God versus the dragon. But the evolution of the Ragnarok story may have at one point, perhaps post-conversion, involved an eventual conflict between Nidhogg and the gods of vengeance, together with the sons of Thor in a new world with new challenges to face. But there's a lot of associations that you can build out of Vali and Vithar. One could easily see them as gods related to oaths, especially ones that require great sacrifice. Obviously, vengeance as well in all of its forms. Sometimes one's own success can be a form of vengeance. With Vithar, it's possible that he was reframed as a god of vengeance, and that before that he was a cosmic deity of some kind. But this concept is rather shaky from what I could find and doesn't have any solid evidence. The idea is, basically, that Vithar's killing of Fenrir may fit into an image of Vithar as a cosmic protector of sorts, and that the killing of Fenrir is done for the sake of preserving the cosmos, and that this was later placed in the context of vengeance. This would mean that Vali is the god of vengeance, and Vithar is something else, maybe more important, perhaps more of a deity that upholds the balance of the universe. There's a lot of extrapolation happening there, and nothing conclusive can really be drawn from it. But it's definitely worth thinking about, and I'm interested in knowing y'all's thoughts on it in the comments down below. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. Be sure to like the vid if you enjoyed it, and the uh, subscribe button and like button are attempting to take vengeance out on each other, which is weird, but also fine. Be sure to ring the bell for more heathen content, and remember to find a way or make one. Dude, trimming your beard is stressful. I'm always afraid I'm just going to ruin everything.